forward to talking about some of the um, details in the bill as we go forward. And just a kind of a broad overview, I think as we started going through, oh, and then in March of 2007, so two years later, Center for American Progress hosted the then seven Democratic candidates um, on a forum of health reform, CeCe's right. Senator Obama um, may have been one of the least eloquent on health care reform at the time, but it was an effort to make sure that the, the Democratic candidates would have health care be highlighted during the, um, the Democratic um, election as we were going through the, the, the process, having them hone it through and try to make sure that health care would be something that would be addressed by the new administration. So as we were going through uh, the past year, CAP's role was um, fascinating working with both the House and the Senate as well as the administration, looking at some policy issues all along the dual goals, I think, of this bill, which I think were attained, and it'll be interesting to talk about it, was expanding coverage while we decrease health care costs. And I think that decreasing health care costs is something, my background, full disclaimer, I'm a primary care person and did graduate work in primary care, and I really believe if we move the system towards more of the delivery of primary care for a number of reasons, we can improve outcomes while we decrease health care costs. And some of the things that we did, we, we brought together um, major thinkers as well as members of the House and Senate staffers as they were trying to figure out what kinds of cost containment they could put into this bill. And um, I think ultimately those two areas was, were actually met. So we're going to be covering another an additional 32 million Americans. I think that there are a lot of things in place that will look at ultimately decreasing the cost curve. And I think ultimately what this is going to do is create some major paradigm shifts. I think that in terms of coverage, we within, I think, a generation will be a nation that feels like everyone does have access to health care. It won't be this fear of if I change jobs, I won't have it. There will be an expectation that everyone has health coverage. And I also hope, I think it's less definitive, but I also hope that we will then, because of the way we change paying for health care, we will change the delivery of health care, starting to look more about paying for the things that make people healthy instead of just paying for more and more services, which is the, the current way we're doing it. I think some of those things will move us towards some of these other nations um, that, we, that we just mentioned that will we'll do a better job covering a broader, collaborative, uh, coordinated system of care and not just the services. Um, and I think that we now have all of this in paper and um, our work is ahead of us. Excellent. Thank you, Ellen Marie. Uh, let me also just one note, which is obviously not everyone thinks enactment of this law is a good thing. Uh, this is a bill that uh, remains controversial, a law now that remains controversial and will, I'm sure, for some time. There are some people that even talk about repeal. I think that that's unlikely for a variety of reasons, and we can we can discuss that as well. But, um, but I want to preface this conversation by saying that just because um, the next thing that I want to get into is how this actually was passed. And I think that most people can agree whether you like the law or not, it was a real legislative achievement. Uh, it is a major piece of social policy legislation, the size of which we probably have not seen uh, since the 1960s in the Great Society. So purely as, a, as an interest in the way that our government and our democracy works today, I'm wondering if any of our panelists can speak a little bit to some lessons learned. Uh, this bill actually became a law. How did it happen? It was pretty messy at times. Uh, could it have happened better, more smoothly, more quickly? What did we learn? I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a first step. We, we learned quite a bit. Um, we, we learned that public opinion does matter, especially as we get closer to any sort of threat of incumbent seats as well as midterm elections. And I do think the president in particular learned from the process that no matter what we try to remember of what worked in Clinton or what did not work during Clinton health reform, the president will ultimately be, be the person that the country looks towards when especially people are talking, they were talking about Obamacare before the president even put through any particulars of his own imprint. Um, and so quickly what you saw towards the end especially was the president putting that imprint upon the bill and putting down some markers of what he thought needed to be done. And that involved corralling a lot of very senior lawmakers and legislators 
to also put them in the same position as well. So I, I would argue that that was one of the lessons that we learned was that we could have taken that pole position of leadership a little bit earlier and that might have smoothed out some of these rougher edges over the last several months. Anyone else? Uh, one thing that um, I think is unclear at this point is what the overall implications are CC for um, the president and the administration in terms of uh, future governance and future uh, legislation. I say that because uh, I, I'm sure all of us are familiar with the, the critiques of the legislation and the, um, and the process from the right. Uh, I think personally that the, the death panel um, hyperbole is hyperbole and, and overstates and actually trivializes um, some issues that, I, uh, that are important for the country to address, particularly as we have expanding technology and new drugs and, and new procedures coming on online. We're going to have to make some difficult choices um, as, as a country uh, in terms of how we address and fund these. So, the, the, But that, I think, is going to continue to, uh, to percolate. What I find interesting is the emergence of some criticism from the left. And in particular, I just, I just finished over the weekend reading Bob Kuttner's um, new book. Bob is with the American Prospect, I believe. So he has a, a very strong um, progressive perspective and, and uh, sort of scathing criticism of the administration. Uh, in large part, the book focuses on the um, um, f fiscal bailout and the uh, Treasury Secretary, the team at the White House, and, uh, and Ben Bernanke. But there are also some, some criticisms about the way the omelet was made, the uh, deals that were cut, uh, I believe, with, uh, with some of the industry representatives, and whether, in fact, uh, it'll be interesting to see how the uh, left uh, uh, responds here. So maybe it, when you're criticizing the left and the right, maybe the president really did do something good, <laughs> uh, being criticized from, from, from both ends of the uh, ideological spectrum. But it is unclear to me what this means now going forth. Is there going to be a rush to ram? if you will, not to ROM, but to RAM, to get as many things through uh, before the first week of November of this year. Uh, and then what happens afterwards? To me, it's really going to be interesting to see how the administration engages over the next several months and the, what its medium to long-term perspective, medium-term perspective will be for the remaining two years of uh, the first, uh, first term. So I think the process has... Uh, created predictable criticism, uh, 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 political criticism from the right, I'm quite surprised at the vehement, vehemence of some of the criticism that's emerging from the left. And so I'd be interested also to hear the uh, audience and, and fellow panelists' reactions about that as well. I guess one thing I would say that we didn't necessarily learn but we were also reminded of is, although we know that politics, all politics is local, what we were so reminded of is all healthcare is personal. And when we were trying to move health care reform through, it's one of those issues, and I think probably one of the few issues, that everyone has such a close personal relationship with. Everyone can think about themselves, their children, their grandparents having to go through this. And because of that, fear was so critical. Fear was uh, something that resonated over and over again. So not only did we have this very personal uh, issue moving through trying to fix it, but we also had it such a complicated there are so many moving parts. We had, I think that one of the things that was a plus was many of those moving parts, many of those stakeholders did come to the table and that was something that was very different in I think this, this piece of legislation and I think might actually be lessons learned for other big pieces of legislation. From the beginning we had the physicians, we had the hospitals, had the insurers, pharmaceutical industries, they all had to come together. Any one of them had the power to kill this as I think we, we saw in the Clinton bill. So we brought all of those folks together, but all of those moving parts created such a comp highlighted the fact that it was such a complicated system. And also then, so the complicated system with also the fears that at the personal level. And I think that this was, this was quite masterful looking at how that came together and finally being able to push it over the finish line. I want to follow up on that notion of bringing the stakeholders uh, to the table because it was such an integral part of the administration strategy um, and yet it became a little bit of a double-edged sword, I would say, uh, because some of the deals uh, were quite controversial. Uh, making a deal with drug companies in this country is not 
universally popular. Uh, there were some people that said that's fine, but $80 billion over 10 years is not enough. It should have been a higher amount. And so where do you eat, each of you come down on, uh, first of all, this strategy of, of bringing them to the table, except, of course, the insurers who remained sort of the popular villain to this day, and I predict will continue to be the popular villain for, for quite some time. Um, did, it, did the administration simply go a little too far, or did Congress go a little too far with, say, the Cornhusker kickback? Uh, or is this the way that legislation gets made? Well, I'll, I definitely think it's the way, and anyone who's worked on the Hill can tell you that that's definitely how legislation gets made. And so I do think that whether it's inclusions for Medicaid matching for certain states or a new medical school in a certain area, those are all kind of typical of what happens. So the part of the process with making a bill I think is very, none of what we saw was atypical other than the magnitude as well as the transparency that I do think the administration tried to put on that and certainly arguably the, the, uh, the additional lesson that I think we learned in the White House was how strongly associated what was going on here on the Hill was tied into what was happening, you know, in the Oval Office. And so with the deals that were being cut to make sure that some votes could be had on this side of, of, the, uh, of, of the Hill was not necessarily reflected or echoed in the strategy sessions that we were having on health reform in the White House, but obviously we're so intimately tied together. And then the stakeholder piece, I, I don't think that we went too far. I do think that you could argue that we never sustained kind of that drumbeat that started with what Charlie witnessed at the summit that we had, and then there was kind of intervening pressures and conflicts, as is typical in any administration, especially with the economy and a lot of the state fiscal crises. And perhaps one thing that we put it, we would have done better would have been to continue that pace, which I think is why the president kind of signaled his own summit convening in February of this year to make that case that this is something that we need to stand united for and brought stakeholders around that summit in separate meetings as well. There's a uh, theory among uh, political scientists and political observers that there's a difference between <clears throat> what a president has to do and say while campaigning and the uh, occasional disconnect between a campaign and what a president has to do and say in terms of governing. Uh, that's happened before. Uh, read my lips. Uh, is one example, the, the president for whom I worked um, came back to uh, haunt him and some people think cost him uh, uh, the uh, re-election. The re uh, it certainly brought Pat Buchanan and others out of the woods uh, to, to challenge a, a, a sitting Republican president. Uh, in this case, though, I think there's a similar problem that has occurred for President Obama, in large part because the enormous outpouring of support, the uh, 13 million people on the, on the web connections, uh, they heard a message for reform, which I think animated them in a way that the country hasn't seen for quite a while. And when you then have the sort of sausage making that uh, we've come to take uh, as part of the process here, I think there have been a number of people who are part of that coalition who have been disappointed. I think it's what brought, may have been one of the things to, uh, to prompt um, Bob Kuttner to write his book. But when you campaign on transparency and, and changing the system, uh, by the way, I would add that the first, first disconnect, by the way, was actually came during the campaigning process where I think, um, Senator Obama had been very much in favor of um, a different type of uh, funding for presidential campaigns and yet proceeded to, uh, during the campaign, opt out of the, uh, the publicly funded system, but yet is now, I think, maintains support for reform. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But I think that the disconnect here between some of the things said during the campaign and what actually happened during the governing process, I think, has led to this growing dissatisfaction on the left. I think it has re led to the um, 
uh, fervor of the Tea Party movement, which uh, has its wacko uh, extremes, uh, but it also has a number of, uh, of independents and, uh, and Democrats who are part of it. So whether this is the normal sort of uh, uh, distinction between campaigning and, uh, and governing, I think remains to be seen. But the, there was such uh, enthusiasm and an outpouring of support uh, during the uh, the campaign that I think it's it's uh, understandable why some people are feeling a little bit uh, let down. I would just say that I, th I think in part because of the transparency, it's part of what made this so ugly. Um, the sausage making we refer to is the statement that sausage is like legislation. You shouldn't see either one being made. And the problem is we saw this being made. So there was some transparency in here that we actually did see those deals that were happening. And these deals you know, predate Obama, your boss, Otto von Bismarck, who made the statement originally. So some of these things, is, as Kavita points out, these are part of what has to happen when you've got something moving through. I think on the flip side, we, there, there may have been some that went too far. And I think the Cornhusker kickback was a perfect example. And that actually ended up being taken out of uh, the final bill because that was to the point of ridiculousness and and I think that these deals are un, as unsavory as they are end up at some point being part of trying to get a massive piece of legislation through. Good. Charlie mentioned uh, in your opening remarks the exchanges and I think a, a preference for regional exchanges and I was wondering maybe if you could expand a little bit on that and then also uh, coincidentally in today's Washington Post um, Bob Moffitt from the Heritage Foundation has an op-ed in which uh, he takes President Obama to task for uh, and essentially says, stop saying that you got some of these ideas from us. We don't, we don't like this law at all. And he specifically focuses on the, the exchange concept. So um, perhaps we could start with Charlie and, and discuss, as I understand it now, there will be state exchanges. Is that correct in the law? I believe, that, I believe that's right. Um, the, uh, the concept of an insurance exchange, I think, is, is critical to uh, insurance market reform because we, in essence, have had, um, I think, a series of, of dysfunctional um, approaches. Um, we haven't had uh, risk pools in this country that actually have been terribly effective. Well, you, we, you, have, you have them in some instances, for example, if you work for Congress or you work for the administration. Uh, if you work for a cabinet department, um, if you're part of the uh, the um, FEHB, which is basically a large um, insurance exchange operated by the Office of, of Personnel Management, it works works pretty well. But to be uh, effective, an exchange, uh, I think, has to have um, a certain critical mass um, in, or in order to um, to, to price out the uh, the risks. And so at, at the Committee for Economic Development, we had actually favored um, an approach to insurance exchanges that was more regional uh, along the lines of something like the, the, the regional structure of the Federal Reserve. Um, and I think we ended up with state uh, exchanges. The question is whether, uh, how they're going to be administered. Um, my expectation is that you might actually end up with regional exchanges, assuming the law permits that, because I think there are going to be some states where you just have really, really small um, risk pools. So I think the, it is important to pay attention, for all of us to pay attention to the implementation. Uh, you're absolutely right. That's going to be the, the critical aspect. But I would focus on, on the exchanges because if we get those wrong, if you have a, I mean, there, there's some cynics on the, on the right who would say, well, the bill is structured so that the exchanges would be too small uh, to succeed. And once they fail, then we'll have um, a public option or some sort of um, device to, uh, to, to clean up the mess. Uh, I do think it's important that we get the exchanges right to have the type of insurance market reform with, with uh, viable risk pools that uh, are necessary to, uh, to make this bill work. And I'll just add, there, there are provisions in the bill, they're mostly for state-based exchanges, but there are potential cooperative groups. That was something of an idea that, um, in particular, Senator Kent Conrad was very kind of proactive in pushing through, and as a result, several states and groups can kind of come together under the direction of the Office of Personnel Management in an FEHBP kind of manner so that they can have a, a broader pool. And I'll just, and then I'll, I'll just add that with the comment that um, 
Bob Moffat made in his piece this morning in the Post, I do think that parts of this are just a reflection of this now kind of, oh, well, you know, this kind of, this late regret of, well, this bill passed and we didn't like it, and so now we're going to express our opinions about how we didn't like it and parse in particular some of the verbs or phrases that the president had used over the past years, even before he was president, about health care. It is, in fact, true that not just the Heritage Foundation, but a number of conservative-leaning think tanks had proposed ideas around state-based exchanges. Uh, personal responsibility was a phrase that we heard many times, and that translated loosely into an employer mandate as well as an individual mandate of some kind, not an employer mandate uh, in fact, what we saw now is in our current bill that passed in the law is that we don't really have a mandate, we have a requirement. What is the difference? Those of us that are legal scholars can tell you there is, in fact, a difference. But I do think that this kind of rash criticism about, well, the president said that this was building on our ideas, and in fact, that's not true, and that this wasn't really something that Republicans had added to is, is simply not true. And that has nothing to do with even the president's words it's in what's passed in the bill. There are pieces of this that actually Senator McCain even proposed around high-risk pooling that were adopted as an interim strategy to make sure that, as Charlie mentioned, these exchanges could be as robust as possible. So it is, it is a little difficult to understand kind of the merit of all of this when what we should be doing is thinking through what are the challenges of implementing this in a successful manner. Could I ask one question, though, on this? And it's, it's um, I'd like to know on the, on the whole issue of the tax treatment of health insurance, there are economists, correct me if I'm wrong in this, I think it's fair to say there's a consensus among both conservative and liberal economists that if you really wanted to change the structure of the system, you would change the tax treatment. That was sort of a starting point going back two or three years ago, but it, it got lost through the politics here. And the Cadillac option uh, issue uh, and the uh, strong opposition by labor to that, um, I think, is an important issue. What happened there? I mean, and this did we by not and, and McCain, by the way, I think, got it right in the uh, in his campaign. I mean, he may not have understood or or, or explained it in full detail, but but I think for people who were, were seriously contemplating a, a, a structural change in the system with economic incentives, a starting point among many economists was dealing with the, uh, the tax treatment of, uh, of, of health insurance benefits. And pre uh, Senator, then Senator Obama just jumped all over him. Uh, and personally, I happen to think that 